Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly, it is good to be here, and I thank God for this opportunity to be able to stand before you and bring tonight's Bible study, um, giving all praise to God, who is the head of my life. I thank, um, thank you. <laughs> I thank, <laughs> I thank my pastor, um, Dr. Harden, for allowing me this opportunity this growth opportunity and this training opportunity for me as well. It was funny because last week I um, came out to support Dr. Brown and Dr. Harden said, will you do um, chapters 20 and 21 and the music stopped and I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So again, I, I praise God and I thank God um, for this opportunity um, once again. Shall we pray? Yeah. Father God, truly, Lord, you are worthy of all praise, glory, and honor. Lord, for you do great things, Lord, and we just can't thank you enough for all that you have done for us, Lord. Father, um, I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be able to stand, Father, for allowing me to grow, Lord, for, for training me up to be the man of God that you would have me to be. Father, I thank you, Lord, for those who are over me, Lord, those who are going to pour into me, those who have poured into me, Father, and Lord, I ask, Lord, at this time that you would allow me to decrease as you increase, yes, Father, Lord. and have your way, Lord, in this Bible study tonight in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You may be seated. So as Dr. Brown um, brought out, we are continuing from, from uh, last week. He finished up 2 Samuel chapter 19, and I stand before you to do... Um, chapter 20, chapters 20 and 21. Um, I'm, I'm learning the, the system, so Ready? if I can have someone to read chapter read chapter 20 for me, yes, it'd be sir. greatly appreciated. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. I'll read chapter 20. Thank you so much. I said, and there happened to be there a man, Belial, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bacharai, a Benjamite, and he blew a trumpet and said, we have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tent, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bacharai. But the men of Judah cleave unto their king from Jordan, even to Jerusalem. And David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took 10 women his concubines, whom he had left to keep the, the house, and put them word, inward, and fed them, but went not into unto, unto them. So they were shut up unto the day of their death, living in widowhood. Then said the king, of Amasa, king to Amasa, Assemble men, the men of Judah, within three days, be thou there here present. So Amasa went to assemble the men of Judah, but he tarried longer than set time than the set time which he had appointed him. And David said to Abishai, Now shall Sheba, the son of Bacharai, do us more harm than, than, than did Absalom. Take thou thy Lord's servants and pursue him, pursue after him, lest he get to the fences, the fence, uh, fence cities and escape us. And there went out after him Joab, me, Joab's men and the Shittites and the Philites, mm -hmm. or Philites, and all the mighty men. And all they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bacharach. When they were at the great stone, which is in Gibeon, a master went before them, and Joab's garment that he had put on was girded unto him, and upon his girdle with a sword fastened upon his loins in the sheath thereof. And as he went forth, it fell out. And Joab said to Amasa, Art thou in he health, my brother? And Joab took Amasa 
by the beard with the right hand to kiss him. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he smote him therein with the fifth rib and shed out his bowels to the ground and stuck him not again, and he died. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, pursued after Sheba, the son of Bacharai. And one of Joab's men stood by him and said, He that feareth Joab, and he that is of, for David, let him go after Joab. And Amasa wallowed in the blood in the midst of the highway. And when the men saw that all the people stood still, he removed Amasa out of the highway into the field and cast a cloth upon him. When he saw that everyone that came by him stood still. When he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bacharai. And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to the, oh Lord, Bethamach, uh, Bethamach? Bethamach. Bethamach, right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hello, somebody. Mm -hmm. All the mm -hmm. <laughs> all the Berites. And they were <laughs> gathered together and went also after him. And they came as, as and besieged him in Abel of Bethamach. And they cast up a bank against the city, and it stood in the trench. And all the people that were with Joab battered the wall to throw, him, to throw it down. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say, I pray you unto Joab, come near hither, that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then he said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaiden, I'm handmaid. And he answered, I do hear. Then she spake, saying, They were wont to speak in old time, saying, they shall, sh they shall surely ask counsel at Abel. And so they ended the matter. I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? And Joab answered and said, Fair be it, far be it, far be it from me that I should swallow up or destroy. This matter is not so, but a man, Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bacchari by name, hath lifted up his hand against the king, even as against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to thee over the wall. Then the woman went unto the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bacchari, and cast it out to Joab. And he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent. And Joab returned to Jerusalem unto the king. Now Joab was over, the, all, over all the hosts of Israel, and Benani, and the son of Jehoiada. Jehoiada, 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 was all over the Sharonites, the Sharatites, and over all the Pal the Pelicites, or Pelicites, Pelicites, or and the ites, and, the ites and, and, and all the ites. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and Adoram was <laughs> over the tribute. And Jehoshaphat, the son of Al uh, Alu uh, Alud. Alud, was recorded. And Sheba was and Sheba was scribe was scribe, and Zadok of ba Abatha was the priest. And Ira also the Jerite was a chief ruler about David. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the reading. So picking up um, where we left off last week, um, at the end of 2 Samuel chapter 19, verse 43, um, we left off with some tension that was brewing about between Israel and Judah. And at the time that all of this was going on, Israel was still one kingdom um, consisting of 12 tribes. So there was no northern kingdom and southern kingdom at the time. Yeah. So... With the death of Absalom, 
it was safe for King David to now return to Jerusalem. Israel, um, who anointed Absalom as their king and aided him in his campaign to kill David, they were forced to flee after the death of Absalom. Um, so when they got back to where they were, Israel began to argue amongst themselves that it would make sense for them to make David their king again. And after all, it was under his reign that they were victorious over their enemies and the Philistines. The text also reveals that even though David was from the tribe of Judah, it was Israel that made the first move in having him reinstated as king, which didn't sit well with David. So he sent two priests by the name of Zadok and Abiathar who, um, to the leaders of Judah to see what their problem was in being so slow about taking him back as their king. Mm -hmm. So, and we can understand Israel's side and Judah's side in this situation as well. It made sense for Israel because of what they did. Um, so in taking David back as king, it would allow them the opportunity to get their chapstick out and do their best to spoil David because they had some serious making up to do with him. Amen, amen. On, <laughs> on Judah's side, they may have been slow um, to accept David back because they may, it's possible they had a fear of being resented by David because he didn't want Absalom killed. So they may have been apprehensive about taking him back, you know, right away. Um, in a political move, David made Amasa, his, um, made Amasa commander of his army in place of Joab, which set well with the leaders of Judah, but it didn't set well with Joab. And we'll find that out as we go further along. David didn't have to do any of this because he was the king, but he cared about the happiness of his people and deemed it better to come home feeling welcome than to walk into a tense atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case in any type of leadership capacity because some things aren't always optional. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like when our parents would tell us, because I said so. You know, we didn't have to like it, but we understood that when they said, because I said so, that was just it. You had to take it and, and deal with it, and make the best of it. So fast forward from Mahanaim, David and his entourage traveled to Gilgal, where he crosses the Jordan, being escorted by the army of Judah and, the half, and half the army of Israel. The problem was that Israel began to complain to David because they felt like Judah was doing way too much and that they were being sidelined in this whole deal. So Judah shot back by saying that David was their kin kinsman, so why are you mad? Why are y'all tripping? Mm -hmm. You know, he, he belongs to us. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's only natural for us, you know, to take the helm in this, in this issue. You know, but, but Israel couldn't see that. They tried to argue that because they had ten tribes, meaning because they had more numbers, superior numbers, they had more right to David than Judah did. But that wasn't the case. So Israel felt disrespected by Judah because, again, Israel was the first to move in bringing, in bringing David back. But Judah's words carried more weight than Israel's. So the problem would be sir similar to reclaiming what's yours from somebody who feels that you didn't want it anymore because they don't see you with it. Mm -hmm. Or having to borrow your own stuff back from somebody else and they get upset because they didn't get to use it like they wanted to. So looking at chapter 20, we have the result of that tension at the end of chapter 19. The rebellion and disrespect was led by a Benjamite named Sheba. He's described as the man of Belial, which means worthlessness, wickedness, and without profit. He also belonged to the tribe of Benjamin, just as Saul did. And you can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And while the Bible doesn't say it, it's safe to say that he despised David because of what happened to his kinsman Saul. Um, and we've seen this type of behavior from, from an individual or groups of individuals. The traditional was, I was here first, or my family is responsible for starting this, and so on. And any attempt to overthrow him or spite him were opportunities that Sheba could not pass up. So Sheba took it up on himself. Um, took it up on himself to end, to end the going back and forth between Israel and Judah by blowing the trumpet or a ram's horn. And what this did was this ended the meeting that was going on or it ended the conversation that was going on. And as I paraphrase, he began to assert his authority 
by saying that Judah wanted nothing to do with us, so let's pack up our tents and go home. Now we have a rebellion, which is an open resistance to David. And this was dangerous because there's an unresolved issue being used as a weapon in the hands of a messy person. And whenever people, whenever possible, we need to work at resolving all issues with other people because unresolved issues between people have a nasty way of ending up at the wrong conclusion because the wrong course of action was taken. Right. And the other thing is that there are things that are gonna happen in our lives at the hands of other people that can't be left unchecked because we don't want to influence others into thinking that they can try us. Um, and as an example, I'll use children. Um, maybe your child or a child that you know of witnessed one of their friends talking crazy to one of their parents and got away with it, which prompted that child to, you know, want to try it when they got home. You know, so maybe they smarted off on Wednesday and woke up on Saturday and realized that it was a bad idea. You know, so there's just some things that, you know, we can't, can't, no, you know, we cannot leave right. unchecked in right. life. Amen. Amen. So in verse 3, when David returned to the palace in Jerusalem, um, the Bible lets us know that he puts the ten concubines away that he left to care for the palace when he fled from Absalom because he, um, the reason why he did this was because Absalom had defiled his concubines. Mm -hmm. um, let me find my place. Um, and this was an unfortunate well, he defiled the concubines back in chapter 16. Correct. And this was an unfortunate consequence for them because they had to pay a price for what went on between David and Absalom. Right. David took care of them, so they wanted for nothing, but they were cut off from David and lived out the rest of their, lived out the rest of their days in this manner. So to allow them to move freely would have been, would have been a painful reminder of what, have hap of what had happened not only to David, but to the people as well. And this cuts deep in another way because it can be looked at as the women were being blamed and punished for something that was not their fault. Um, I mean, either you resist, Ab resist Absalom and risk death, you know, what were they to do? You know, in today's world, it's wrong to tell a woman it's her fault for being raped, you know. But what happened between the concubines and Absalom was also a fulfillment of 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11, that says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. And in um, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, it says, For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. So a little history on concubines. Back then, concubines are what the world calls today a side chick, basically. <laughs> so, so back then, it was legal for a husband to have sex with slaves, and he could take up to seven concubines plus a wife, but the concubines were also subject to the wife's authority. Yeah. Under the Mosaic law, concubines are female slaves, that didn't please their masters um, they were, um, that were married to them, they could be redeemed by their family, but they could not be sold by their master to foreigners because he didn't treat them right. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 10 through 14, it lets us know that if a woman was led away captive after battle, before her captor could marry her, he would have to take her home, shave her head, trim her nails, replace the clothes she was taken captive in, then she had to be allowed to, to mourn for a whole month um, for her mother and father. And then and only then was it acceptable for him to marry her. But if he decided that the marriage was over, she was free to go wherever she wanted to and couldn't be sold because the man humiliated her. Mm -hmm. Concubines were not wives. In 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 13, let's just know that. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and they were yet sons and daughters born to David. Judges 8, 30, and 31. And Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his, bod of his body begotten, for he had many wives. And his concubines, that was in Shechem, 
she also bare him a son whose name called Abimelech. So again, concubines were not wives. Now to sleep with the king's concubine was a huge insult and disrespect to the throne. And we find that in chapter 16 where Ahithophel, who gave counsel to Absalom, told him that sleeping with his father's concubines would show the people that he is abhorred, which means morally offensive to David. Mm -hmm. So in verses 4 and 5, and let me know if I'm going too fast, just say slow down. In verses 4 and 5, David is ready to deal with Sheba's rebellion at the root of the problem, which is Sheba himself. And mm -hmm. going after Sheba, um, there are two things that should help us in dealing with the problem. Number one, keep your problem small. And number two, deal with it at the source. <laughs> going after the men of Israel could have made Sheba's claim in verse one legit. But since he was the one making all the noise, it made more sense to go and silence him. So David knew that if Sheba's disrespect were left unchecked, um, what they went through with Absalom would take a back seat in comparison to what they would have to face with Sheba. Now, while both Absalom and Sheba had strong dislikes for Dave, David, Absalom came after David in an attempt to solve the problem between them. But Sheba was more dangerous because wherever he fled, there was no one to challenge anything that he said, which meant that he could sow seeds of discord about David and Judah wherever he went. So that would have created a bigger problem for Judah in the sense that they could have had more enemies, you know, built up against them as opposed to what they had in dealing with Absalom, which was just Absalom and Israel. Mm -hmm. But Sheba being allowed to run free, you know, away from the conflict, he was able, you know, to go and say, hey, Judah's no good, yada, yada, yada. You know, I need you guys to side with me. He was, you know, he was able to do more damage than Absalom, you know, had set out to do. Okay, so let me find my place again. Okay, so David gives Amasa an assignment. He gave him three days to get the men of Judah together and report back to him, but for reasons not given in the Bible, three days wasn't enough. We can say that there was a loyalty issue because the men favored Joab over Amasa. We can even say that they were tired from the conflict involving Absalom. But again, the Bible doesn't say, so we don't, we don't know why he, was, he wasn't able to return to King David in three days. Mm -hmm. So David tells Abishai to take some men and get after Sheba before he gets to a place where he can't be touched. So he took Joab's men, not Joab, he took Joab's men, the Sherathites and the Pelotites and all the mighty men. Now, they arrived at a, at a large stone in Gibeon, and Amasa arrived at the stone first, and the men that he could muster up. They also um, arrived there before um, Abishai and, and the men that, that um, David sent out with him. Um, but we also see that Joab himself was there. Again, David didn't give the order for you know, Joab to go, but we see that Joab was there anyhow. Right. Now, we need to understand that Joab wasn't in command, but at the same time, the Bible doesn't say that he was forbidden from going along either. One commentary says that he may have went along as a reformado, which by definition is an officer that had been deprived of his command, but still retained his rank. So Joab had been harboring ill feelings against Amasa, for a minute because he felt that the commander position held by Amasa was his and now the opportunity to do something about it had presented itself. Mm -hmm. Joab was wearing a tunic with a sword in its sheath strapped to his waist. Now Joab, he was tactically smart. You gotta give him his props. He was a tactically smart man and he knew that he had to do this right. Mm -hmm. If he drew his sword in front of Amasa, it might set him off and foil his plan. So what does he do? He allows the sword to fall out like it was a wardrobe malfunction or some type of rookie mistake to which Amasa was none the wiser. So this had to be a small sword because the Bible lets us know that Amasa, he didn't even see it. Right. 
And Joab was cold-blooded because he asked Amasa, you know, if he was in good health. You know, <laughs> then he grabbed his beard with his right hand and stuck him one time with the left. And he killed him. And it hadn't been made official by David because he was unaware of took he was unaware of what took place, but the troops in Abishai had no problem with Joab being in charge. So Joab got what he wanted. And we need to remember that envy wants what you have, but jealousy will surely try and take it. And the things that come easy don't always last long. Psalm 75 and 6 tells us that, For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. In verse 7, But God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. So Joab would get what was coming to him, and that would come before David died. He told Solomon of Joab's acts, and it was Solomon who ordered Joab's death at the hand of Benaiah, in 1 Kings chapter 2. Mm -hmm. So having no regard for what happened, Joab and his brother left the mass's body right where it was and continued on with their mission, which was to get Sheba. Um, take serious inventory of who's around you because the very people in your presence are not always for you. You think you know a person until they do something you didn't think they were capable of, or like they say, people love you until, you know, until they don't. <laughs> so Joab's influence over the troops was strong because one of them stands by a master's body like it was a promotional prop and basically says, he that favoreth Joab and he that is for David, let him go after Joab. In other words, they were all going after Sheba because those were the king's orders, but liking Joab seemed to be more important. The soldier went so far as to put Joab's name before David's, showing where his loyalty really was. You know, he was cool with David being the king, but his loyalty was, was um, exclusively to Joab. So the people stood not because of what the man said, but because Amasa wasn't dead yet. Now let me say that there's no contradiction between verses 10 and 12. Verse 10 tells us what happened to Amasa and gives us the end result of him being stabbed, which was death. But verse 12 lets us know that he hadn't died yet because it says that he wallowed in blood. And the word wallow means to roll. So if he's rolling, he's not dead yet. So upon seeing this, the soldier realized that Amasa's wallowing in his blood was being a distraction. So the soldier, he came over and he took the body of of Amasa and placed it in a field and threw a cloth over him. And only then after doing that, the people decided that, okay, we'll, we'll follow Joab and go get Sheba. Mm -hmm. So verse 14, while Judah had been wasting time um, conducting an inside job, which is basically what it was, and it's unfortunate that we have a lot of inside jobs that, that take place in the church, you know, to where the point where the enemy doesn't have to do anything but just sit back and watch the church destroy itself from the inside out. Uh -huh. So this, this was an inside job because Amasa, um, Joab, Abishai, they were all supposed to be on the same team, and they were family. Right. They were all supposed to be working together, but because Joab didn't get what he felt that he should have, he, um, you know, he struck out on his own and, and took the dark path. Okay, so in verse 14, again, while they had been wasting time on an inside job, Sheba was going around recruiting some help from his, for himself. He and his men would wind up in a bell of Beth Makkah, where, where they would now find themselves surrounded. With the city on lockdown, Joab's army set up ramps or mounds of earth against the city wa city's walls and began the process of knocking them down for the purpose of gaining access into the city. Now, Joab's approach, it shows that he was not trying to negotiate, which was wrong because in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 10, in the Amplified Version, it reads that when you advance to a city to fight against it, you shall first offer it terms of peace. Joab didn't do this, so it took a wise woman from within the city walls to call out to Joab 
in the hopes of being able to talk to him and resolve the issue more peacefully. So in, sh in essence, Joab, he needed to slow down. You know, we can be so focused on getting what we want and accomplishing a task to where we don't give any regard to the mistakes, you know, that we have potential for making along the way. You know, had Joab, you know, broken these walls down and gotten to the city, word could have gotten back to David about how he conducted himself, which would have set him in trouble because David didn't put him in charge of anything. So that could have, you know, laid up consequences for him and Abishai because Abishai was the one that David placed in charge. Abishai was the one that David sent out after after Amasa failed to return within those three days. Correct. So that short-term thinking of Joab would have had some long-term consequences. Good point. So once Joab identifies himself because the woman was asking, you know, hey, where's, you know, you know, where's Joab? You know, can he, you know, Joab, can you come closer, you know, so we can talk this thing out? So once Joab identified himself, the woman only asked to be heard out. Now the city was surrounded, Sheba wasn't going anywhere, so Joab lost nothing by listening. And the woman establishes that the city was known for being peaceful and solving people's matters. And there was a saying about the city that was, that, um, as I paraphrase, that says, if you wanted to settle an argument, ask advice in the city of Abel. And people would say that if you wanted to settle, yeah, if you wanted to settle an argument, ask, it, ask advice in the city of Abel. So she tells Joab that she is one of the many that love peace and remain faithful in Israel. She goes on to tell him that he was about to destroy a city that had no issue with David, Judah, or anyone else. Mm -hmm. A mother in Israel was another way of saying that, was another way of saying a chief, a chief city with towns or villages under it. And as an inheritance of the Lord, she was reminding Joab that the city was also in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on to verse, I'm sorry, before I move on, it should also be, be pointed out that this, this woman was attempting to save the lives of everyone else in that city. At the risk of losing her own life, she comes out to speak, you know, to a man that's bent on breaking the walls down for the purpose of saving the lives of everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, puts me in the mind of Christ with the, that selfless act. You know, she was willing to die, you know, just for the sake of, you know, everybody else being able to survive. So verses 20 through 26, after listening to this woman and determining that she was not in cahoots with Sheba, Joab assures her that it is not his intention to destroy the city but she's in possession of a man named Sheba who rebelled against David. Hand him over and I'll leave, is basically what Joab tells the woman. Woman in response, as I paraphrase, I'll do you one better. I'll throw his head over the wall. So the woman goes back into her people and tells them what's, you know, what's happening and they cut off Sheba's head and toss it over the wall. So upon getting Sheba's head, the trumpet is blown and Joab, along with his men, um, withdraw back to Jerusalem. So going further down, um, as this chapter comes to a close, we see that it looks like um, everyone is being promoted, more or less. But this is um, David's, um, David's administration that we're looking at in these, in these last verses. Um, the changes on the list are not, you know, not very numerous. Joab was again at the head of the army. Benaiah, who was David's bodyguard, um, as before, was back in command of the Sheratites and Pelotites. Jehoshaphat was still the recorder. Sheba was a scribe. Um, Zadok, Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. And let's see, in two cases, there was a change. A new office had been instituted. Adoram was um, over the tribute um, because there were so many foreign states which had to pay a yearly tribute to David, so it was necessary for this change to be made. And in the earlier list, which is found in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 15, it said that David's, David's um, sons were chief rulers, but 
in this chapter we see that there's no mention of his sons now. Mm -hmm. And the chief ruler is now Ira the Jairite. Mm -hmm. So that is chap chapter 20's summary. And do I open it up for questions? Or? All right, at this time I'm opening it up for questions and comments. Mm -hmm. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. Please. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Let me get one comment that was a signer uh, and very good job. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. In verse uh, four, where that Amasa was to go, and David gave him those three days. Joab, being a captain, and knew it was something wrong mm -hmm. because he didn't come back in time. Mm -hmm. So he just didn't kill him because of jealousy, but he did it because he was a unique leader. And he, he said, something got to be wrong because a, a master should have been back here okay. earlier. Mm -hmm. So maybe he was had something to do with, shall, what's his name up here? I got him here. Here we go. Here. Sheba. With Sheba. Okay. Maybe he went out and said something to Sheba and told him what to do, so I better get rid of him now gotcha. because I got an enemy in the camp. Got you. All right. Got you. So he, in essence, he was saying that he possibly thought that a master may have defected, you know, and, and went, went to work for the other side. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we, we you know, kind of understand where Joab was, you know, why he felt the way he felt because Amasa was also um, in charge when Absalom was coming after, um, was coming after King David. And, and after um, Absalom d died, David didn't remove him from that position. He kept him in that position, you know, and the Bible lets us know that the leaders of Judah thought that was a good idea. So it was a political move, even though, even though Joab didn't like it, you know, it was something that needed to be done, you know. So he had to accept the fact that, you know, it wasn't about, it wasn't about him. You know, there was a bigger picture, you know, involved. <laughs> Amen. Right, right. And I, I don't, you know, me personally, I don't feel like he used the woman. The woman was the one that implemented the, 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 the diplomacy that needed to take place. He should have, you know, like the Bible said, approached her and or approached the, you know, the city as a whole and asked, you know, are you for peace, you know, or are you for war? But he didn't do that. He immediately, you know, just, okay, let's get him. Let's do what we do, you know, with Well, I, I can't say that she fit well, into the plan, but. She was trying to save the city was the bottom line. Right, right absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah, in and, and that regard, yeah, that, that was her plan yeah. to save, you know, to save her city. So. And also, too, we must always remember, too, in, in times of where you have the elders, right? The elders are the ones who are always in charge of the history. Mm -hmm. No one need the information in regard to the city. So we have that today. You know, we have yes. big mamas. We have, uh, you know, we have people who know the history and know the rules and regulations mm -hmm. within families. Yes. You know, so those things are passed on, mm -hmm. you know, as they move. And but again, we must also sh um, recognize too that in her receiving the information, she was also a wise woman in mm -hmm. regard to, 
um, you have using of wisdom to apply the laws of the land. So mm -hmm. she was not ignorant either. Right. She had wisdom and she was not ignorant of the laws of the land, even in mm -hmm. battle or war, as mm -hmm. she said. Well, you know th what the law says. If you want, if we have an issue. Yes. But there's there's what there's a process. What we're supposed to go through first. Mm -hmm. You know better than that. So why would you now come against us and not do what you know what is uh, was supposed to be done first? Amen. Amen. So again, it challenges him in regard to like we got to flag the rules. Now that's not like that today, right? Mm, yeah. There ain't no such thing as rules today. You do whatever you want, <laughs> right? So <laughs> we can see the difference, right? Because like you know, we say that when we grew up in the seventies, we. You need to talk about the the cat generation where there were rules within the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, you mm -hmm. come up further than that. We said the dog generation, that ain't gonna happen. Right. You know, these brothers ain't playing. You right. know, so right. there ain't no such thing as rules. So again, we res respect the rules, and they are uh, um, historical uh, in regard to um, rules, regulations, fables, and things that that holds everyone accountable to the for the traditions mm -hmm. that they all should know and apply to. But we must also give Joe Abner the credit, too, that he recognized that when he was challenging the rules, he didn't use his authority as a man yes. to overpower her. Right. 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 He honored it. Right. Because, again, now we can say the bad things about Joab, but Joab still operate in some very good principles. Yes, he did. Right. Yes. And this was one of them. Yes. That he could use his authority and overpower her. But he didn't. He heard her. Mm -hmm. He made the case. He reconciled the deal. And he honored what was asked of him to be done. Amen. Again, too. So again, even in the midst of uh, of, um, of us, and things are not always going on. But it's and that's see us leaders, and that's why we we don't know the heart. You know, our mm -hmm. hearts are different. Sometimes we don't always exercise what we ought to. Amen. But there are times when you see the trueness of us still operate the way we should. Yes. And that's the balance between us cons being consistent, or sometimes there's this. We're just challenged, you yes. know. I was not um, as a leader. I am not going to always make the right decision. Amen. Right. Amen. I'm not, uh, and there's all, and I may not concede to the meter. Hello, somebody. Amen. <laughs> right? Amen. But Amen. Uh, through time, you know, and things. So these are these are lessons that we need to learn as leaders that we must continue to balance mm -hmm. and always do what is right and what is best and what is just. Amen. And that's what the Bible teaches us. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Amen. Yes. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. the, the bigger mm -hmm. picture. Mm -hmm. exactly. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Amen. And, and also, um, spiritually, when we look at um, Sheba um, fleeing into the city, um, we, you know, Sheba can represent the things that we allow to come into our lives that occupy space that we really shouldn't give it. Amen. You know, so there are a lot of Sheba experiences that, you know, we need to just you know, kick out of our lives, kick out of our heads because we, you know, have enough stuff going on with, without taking on, you know, more mess. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, Brother Lonnie, I, I was looking at it. Uh, I went back to where uh, Joab was instrumental in Killing Absalom, even though David told him not to mess with uh -huh, the young man. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna say that I feel like David had a little something, something. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Come on, y'all. Uh -huh. Yes. David had a little something, something mm -hmm. against against his because he knew the heart of Joab. Oh yeah. Because whatever he wanted, Joab was so in tune to David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He loved David so much that he 
he would kill anybody for David. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Joab just feel like, okay, Absalom has tormented David for so many years, mm -hmm. and David has been running and in caves. And now Absalom is a fighting in his group, in his army. Furthermore, Absalom is the, it says in here, he is the chief of the host, mm -hmm. which is he's in charge of the whole army. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. He's in charge of the whole army. Yes. All right, of Israel. Yes. This other person that 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 J David just looked over, he just like I'm not giving, I'm not, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Joab did something he wasn't supposed to do, and I don't like it. Mm -hmm. But David is not the one that confronts. Right. Right. David doesn't confront his own problem. He didn't deal with his own problem mm -hmm. with his children. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. David didn't confront. Mm -hmm. He should have confronted Absalom. He should have dealt with that. So what you don't deal with, you said it. You mm -hmm. Perfect. The lesson was just good. He didn't deal, but but David didn't deal with his problem. So if, like you said, if you don't deal with it now, it's coming up again. Mm -hmm. Yes. That yeah. same problem going to hit you in the face again. Yes. Because he was passive mm -hmm. in his dealing with his children. Mm -hmm. But he's aggressive in his dealing with other people mm -hmm. and army. Mm -hmm. He is a great warrior. Mm -hmm. Joab learned from him. But he is David's armor bearer. Mm -hmm. Yes. So he's care he's he's gonna fight for David. Period. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. So if it meant taking out David's son, that's his enemy, he took him out. Yes. And made sure he was taken out, but David didn't take too kindly of that. Mm -hmm. Remember, he grieved. Mm -hmm. He grieved over Absalom. And it was joy. I'm saying, look, man, get up. <laughs> <laughs> get up. Uh, Shut yeah, up. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, you know. Uh, come on now. Come on, if you was in, if you was out there fighting mm -hmm. in America's <laughs> army, and here's somebody do you, you know, on the other side, okay, we doing it right now with Trump and Putin. Putin. Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. And you don't assign your people to kill some of America. Aren't we doing this? Aren't we? Didn't we just see this a couple of months ago, a mm -hmm. month ago, where it said that the Taliban was hired to fight against America's troops, mm -hmm. and they killed them. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Mm -hmm. So how would you feel if somebody is coming against you out here fighting for America? Mm -hmm. And then somebody else, whoever's fighting against us, I'm gonna take him out. I don't care if he's your friend. Right. 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 Right? Right. We're talking about military wise. Yes. Yes. Regardless if he's your friend or not. I don't care if, if Putin is president. Trump's friend. Mm -hmm. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So that's the way uh, Joab mm -hmm. felt about David's enemy. Yes. I'm going to take him out. Yes. So when this other, when David appointed Amasa <laughs> over, it was military, mm -hmm. but it also was a slap in the face yes. to Joab. Yes. And mm -hmm. I'm going to say he did it intentionally. Because mm -hmm. he killed his son. Amen. Amen. Because he killed his son. So I'm gonna get back at you. I'm gonna give I'm gonna take some I'm gonna take some some power from you mm -hmm. and I'm gonna give it to this other person. Mm -hmm. And Amen. then when this other person don't really act like he think he ought to act, <laughs> then he sent somebody else. Yep. To get him. You see what I'm saying? Yes. He sent in somebody else to get him. I'm just like that. I'm just crazy like that. You know, He's going to send somebody else to get him. Come on. Amen. If, if he really trusted him, why he going to send somebody else to get him? Right. Right. You know? Right. And so Joab again. Because Joab is rootless. Mm -hmm. But he loved David. Yeah. So he's going to kill all of David's enemies. And he feel like, you know, I'm doing the right thing. Because I really... Love David, mm -hmm. and so he made a mistake. And but he was ruthless. He's just like the the mention of it is he betrayed, he betrayed 
a mess up. Yes. He betrayed him. Yes. He gave him a kiss, and then he stabbed him in the belly. Yes. And then he let him. He did, he just let him. He just let him suffer. Yep. And went on. You know, he just <laughs> let him suffer. Let him gurgle around in his own blood. He was rootless. Mm -hmm. And so then David is going to see again in Kings. He's going to get him back. Yep. Yeah, he was very mission-oriented. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful lesson. Praise Thank God. You. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead to 21. 21. Okay. I'll read for you. Uh, then there was a famine in the, la in the day of David, three years after. And David re inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, How now he now the Gibeonites are not the children of Israel, but of the remedy of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in zeal to his children of Israel and Judah. Whereof, wherefore David said unto Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver, nor gold, or Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shall thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, what shall, we say, what shall we say that will I do for you? And they answered the king, the men that consumed us and that divide against, against us, that we should be destroyed, from whom, from reminding in any, remaining in any of the coast of Israel, let, e let seven men of his son be delivered unto us and we will hang them upon the house of Gibeah. And Saul, whom the Lord did choose, and the king said, I will give them, and I will give you them. But the king spared Mephibosheth and the son of, Je of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because the Lord had, the Lord, the Lord oath that were between them between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Ripha and the daughter of Ahar, Ahar whom the bared unto Saul, uh, Amana, and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she begot, she brought up for a drill, and the son of Brazila, the uh, Maholites, and he delivered them unto the hand of the Gibeonites, and they hung, they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and they fell all seven together, and was put to death. In the day of the harvest, in the first day, in the beginning of the barley crop, was Zepho, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it hid from her upon the rock, from the beginning of the harvest until the water dropped upon them out of the heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. And it was told David what Rithpah and daughters of Ar and the concubines of Saul had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of, J of Jabez Gilead which had stolen them from the streets of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, where the Philistine had hanged them, when the Philistine had slain Saul in Gibor. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, and the sons they gathered the bones, them, bones to them that was hanged. And the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, buried they in the country of Benjamin, in Zila, in the sepulchre of Kish, his father, and they perform all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. Moreover, in the Philistines had yet war again with Israel. And David went down, and his servant with him, and fought against the Philistine, 
and David waxed faint. And Ishabah, not Benob, which was of the son of the giant, the weight of the whom spear weighed 300 shekels, shekels of brass in weight. And he being girded with a new sword, thought, he, thought to have slain David. But Abashai, Abash, the son of Zeruel, scourged him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David sweared unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou squinge not the night of Israel. And it came to pass after this that there was a, again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Shebeka, the Hushnite, slew Shah, which was of the son of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with Philistine, where uh, Elhanah, the son of Jar, Orin, the Bethamite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, and staff of whom spear was like a weaver beam. And there was yet a battle of Gob, where was a man of great stature that had every hand, on every hand six fingers, and on every toe six toes, four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giants. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan the son of Shemael, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in God and fell by the hands of David and by the hands of his servant. Amen. Amen. All right. So the things that take place um, in these next four chapters, um, being 21, 22, 23, and 24, didn't happen in chronological order. Um, which means they weren't arranged in, a, in order according to time. So the first 14 verses in this chapter were said to have taken place after David showed kindness to Mephibosheth in chapter 9 and before Shemi cursed and threw stones at David in chapter 16. Now, this chapter opens up with a three-year famine during David's reign. As a food source, agriculture was an important thing um, back then in a great portion of its success was dependent upon the weather. So no rain meant no harvest, which meant no food. And they didn't have irrigation systems set up like we do today when you're driving along the freeway and you see this automatic sprinkler system going on, watering the fields. They didn't have anything remotely close to that. So in the midst of all of this, something didn't set right with David about the famine. So he turned to God in search of an answer. God told him that the famine was a result of Saul and what the Bible says, Saul's bloody house. Um, they were guilty of killing the Gibeonites. But, David, um, but had David not sought the Lord first, he would have never understood the famine was ordered by God, and he would have never known why. And let me say this, while none of us enjoy suffering, it helps to know why we're going through it because I believe that we can handle it better and we can better direct our prayers towards God when we understand why we're going through what we're going through. And this is one reason why we need to be specific in our prayers and asking others to pray for us as well. It's not necessary to lay out a whole movie script when you're asking someone to pray for you. Just tell them, I have this and that going on in my life. Can you pray for whatever it is, strength to endure, for, you know, for peace? You know, just be, you know, short and straight to the point. Don't take them from A to Z because you don't want to lose the person that you're asking to pray for you. So Saul's zeal, um, the Bible lets us know his zeal um, basically is what caused him to sin. Saul was from Gibeah, which was close to um, Gibeon. And he may have been trying to claim the territory when he became king. Mm -hmm. So to refer to his house as being bloody, it tells us that the sons of Saul may have also played a role in trying to wipe out the Gibeonites. Now, David calls for the Gibeonites to come before him. And even though they were not Israelites, they were protected under an oath. There you go. When Joshua was leading the Israelites in the conquest of Canaan, 
the Gibeonites heard what had happened to Ai in Jericho, so they concocted a plan to where they pretended to be travelers from a far off country, and they came to Joshua and Gilgal and asked him to make a covenant with them. Some of the Israelites were sketchy about it and believed that, you know, they're local. So in their minds, why, why would we want to make a covenant with you guys? So um, what happened next was when they realized who the Gibeonites really were, well, they didn't realize who the Gibeonites really were, but when they asked who they really were, the Gibeonites stuck to their story, that they were travelers from a far-off land. And because Israel didn't check with God first, like the Bible says, they brought into the lie that the Gibeonites had told them. So it wasn't until three days after agreeing to the covenant that Joshua learned that the Gibeonites were practically their neighbors, had been their neighbors the whole time. So needless to say, the Bible lets us know that the people, they were angry. You know, they wanted blood. They wanted to kill the Gibeonites. But the leaders had to remind them that, that they couldn't break the covenant without facing wrath from God. So the Gibeonites that were also known as the Hivites, and you can find that in Joshua chapter 11, verse 19, they were put in servitude to Israel as cutters and gatherers of firewood and water carriers for the entire congregation, and this was to be a continuous thing. So right off the bat, when we suffer, we should be turning to God first. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be asking other people for advice or their opinions, but go to God first. David asked the Gibeonites, as I paraphrase, how can I make this right with you so that, in turn, you can bless the Lord's inheritance, which is the land of Israel. And the sooner things were set right with Gibeon, the sooner the famine would end and the land could go on being blessed. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 25 tells us that our iniquities, your iniquities have turned away these things and your sins have withholding good things from you. So in short, sin blocks our blessings, and the land was suffering because of something someone else did. Uh -huh. So we also see that sin has a ripple effect because Saul is long gone. But the effects of what he did, it's carried on to everyone that's still alive. So sin not only affects us, it affects others as well. Mm -hmm. yep. So in response to David, the Gibeonites tell David that we don't want your money and we don't want you to kill anybody on our behalf. To which David responds, well, whatever you say, then that's what we'll do. So when David uttered these words, he basically locked himself into a commitment that he couldn't back out of. Yeah. And as the king, he would have to honor whatever the Gibeonites requested. Yeah. And we also find this in the New Testament in Mark chapter 6, where King Herod told his daughter that he would give her whatever she asked um, even if it was half of his kingdom. So what did the daughter do? She went to check with her mother and came back and requested the head of John the Baptist. Amen. And the Bible lets us know that it grieved the king to do it, but again, he had to honor his word. So the Gibeonites told David that since it was Saul who wanted to wipe us out, we'll take seven of his sons, sons can also mean grandsons, and we'll hang them before the Lord on the hill um, we'll hang them before the Lord who chose Saul, and we'll do it in Saul's hometown of Gibeah. So this was an act of disgrace towards the family for all the pain that Saul and his bloody house had caused them. And David agreed to their request, but Mephibosh Mephibosheth was to be spared because of the oath made between Jonathan and David, which is um, found in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse, verse 14, which says, and thou shalt not only while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord that I die not, but also that thou cut not cut off, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. So there was an oath in play that covered Mephibosheth. Um, I don't know about now, but once upon a time in the Israeli culture, they believed that the family was one. So an entire family could be held accountable for the crimes of the father. That was the, tra the tradition in that culture. But the Bible tells us something different. The Bible tells us that we need to keep any oath or vow that we make. And it also tells us that we're held accountable 
for our actions. Deuteronomy 24, 16, the fathers shall not put to death for the, the fathers shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for their fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear iniquity, shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So the seven chosen by David were two sons of Rizpah, who was the daughter of Ai, um, whom she bare unto Saul, Armani, and Mephibosheth. Now this Mephibosheth was not this um, Mephibosheth we just talked about. This Mephibosheth was a son of Saul. So it was these two and the five sons of My Michal or Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up from a drill, the son of Barzillai, the Mahalatite, and this is not the same Barzillai that um, was talked about in chapter 19. Thank you. Thank you. It's a different, different person. So um, verse 9, all of all the sons of Saul were put to death on the hill at the start of the barley harvest. Now the bar barley harvest occurred towards the end of April um, and between the, around the end of April, beginning of May, and lasted um, until sometime in October. Now the crops of the barley harvest were a reminder to the people of how God had provided for them. It involved presenting the Lord a sheaf of barley accompanied by uh, burnt grain and drink offerings. Um, now, for the entire season after, after the seven were, were hung, for the entire season, a heartbroken rispa built a tent close to the bodies to keep watch over them to scare away the birds and beasts because it was considered a disgraceful and dishonorable thing for the bodies of the dead to become food for the animals and to be left unburied. Mm -hmm. um, and let me say this, death affects everyone differently. Um, we don't even know how we're going to respond when that time comes for us. It's always easy for us to say, I know what I'm going to do, you know, in this situation. But the truth is, you don't know until you're in that situation, right. you know. And make no mistake, especially when it comes to death, we're all going to get a turn, you know, to experience that. So don't tell somebody that they need to get over it when they're hurting right. because you don't know what they're going through. That was their own unique relationship with that person. You know, this woman had lost two sons. So there, was a vo there were two voids in her life that couldn't be filled. And who's to say that mentally she probably, you know, had checked out. And, you know, could you blame her? You know, so sometimes we just need to, you know, do what Job's friends should have did on his behalf. They should have just showed up, you know, and been quiet. You know, not to tell him, maybe you did this, maybe you did that. No, when people are hurting, sometimes the best thing you can do for them is just show up to be supportive for them. They don't need you there to tell them, you know, get over it, it's time to move on. It's like, no, that's the quickest way to get your feelings hurt and possibly get phys physically hurt, yeah. you know. <laughs> you know, when, like they say, hey, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> so hold your lips together and yes, just... Sir. Just be there for that individual because, you know, it may cut them deeper. It may cut them deeper than it, you know, cuts you. So let them go through it. If they got to pull over in this life and have a moment, let them have their moment. Amen. Okay. So verses 12 through 14, word got back to David about Rizpah. He sent messengers to retrieve the bones of Jonathan and Saul. After the deaths of Saul and his sons, the Philistines had cut off Saul's head and sent his, sent his armor to the house of Ashtaroth and fastened his body with his sons to a wall. But the men of Jabesh Gilead stole the bodies um, during the night and brought them to Jabesh where they burned them, placing the bones under a tree in Jabesh where they fasted for several days. And you can find that in 1 Samuel chapter 31. So Saul, um, Jonathan, and the seven members of Saul's family were buried properly in the tomb belonging to Saul's father, located in Zelza. And it was only then um, that the famine came uh, to an end. L and let me say this, um, I think I may have worded it wrong. The famine didn't end because the bones were properly, were properly um, buried. The famine ended after the Lord was satisfied with the action that the Gibeonites took 
against um, Saul's household. So after they were hung, that's what that's what ultimately ended the famine, not not the um, bones being properly being properly buried. Correct. Okay. All right. So moving on, um, verses 15 through 22. Um, now we have a totally different event. We have conflicts um, between Israel and the Philistine giants. Israel was um, no stranger to giants, but now it seems that they have nerved up since David slew Goliath, you know, because at that first encounter with Goliath, nobody wanted a piece of Goliath. Nobody wanted anything to do with Goliath. But now we see that um, they're not afraid to fight these giants. So um, let's see. At, that, at the same time, it was shameful. Well, let me start over. Israel was no stranger to, stranger to giants, but now it seems like they've nerved up since David slew Goliath. And at the same time, it's shameful for the king to be fighting while a so-called soldier of his is not. And what this um, revealed to me was that conflict has a way of exposing just how committed we are to God. We can talk a good one until it's our turn to stand up for God, who we claim to love so much. We're quick to hand out faith assignments and delegate when it's really time for us to step up to the plate and put our hands to the plow. Yeah. So in the midst of this battle, David David weakens, and the son of a giant named Ishbi Banab saw what he thought was a golden opportunity to kill David, but Abishai stepped in and killed the giant. Now, the consensus from all, the, all of David's men was basically, and they wouldn't tell David this, but your fighting days are over. You know, <laughs> with all that David had done, with all that God had done through, through David, he became a symbol of Israel's hope and security so they expressed to him how his survival was important to Israel. David had nothing to be ashamed of because his men knew that he was the real deal and he had proven himself to be an excellent warrior and king. So it was okay for him to step back and allow those under him to step forward and handle the business. He was still king, but it was time to leave the fighting alone. And it doesn't matter if you're a leader at church, at home, at work, or wherever, when you have people under you, train them to be leaders. Delegate responsibility to them. Help them to help you by allowing them to grow. And I thank God again for Dr. Harden allowing me to get up here. My flesh may have said no when he asked me last week, but spiritually, when I said yes to God, I did ask to be up here because that's how I'm going to grow. Now, there would be three more battles with three different giants, all resulting in the death of the giants. And David could rest assured that he had capable men willing to carry on the fight. With each opportunity, David's confidence in the ability of his men grew. From David's perspective, there's going to come a time when we can't do certain things anymore. So are we leaving a good legacy behind for the next person to pick up and carry on with? From the soldier's end, Maybe you're not in, in a leadership position, and maybe you have no desire to be, and that's okay. But in the position that you're in, are you willing to be committed to helping the one that is leading to succeed? Thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm. We will allow one or two questions. If anybody have any, I think he went over it well. <laughs> Going once. All right, let's give him a hand. Amen. Amen. Get the mic, the mic, the mic. Going back to Absalom, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I, I, I just, you know, in the natural, you just think of what a terrible son he was, and you know, him raping his sister and doing all these ugly things to his concubines of his father, and all these sins mm -hmm. that he committed, you know, and you just thought of him as absolutely terrible son. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. And it should also be pointed out that it wasn't Absalom that raped the sister, it was the brother, brother that, raped, that raped the sister. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. amen. Right. amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's give, uh, um, let's give Minister Lonnie a, a hand. God bless you, Elder Jones. God bless you.
That was good. That's good. See, I can take a rest <laughs> and know that I got folks that are capable of moving yeah, this so on. That's what. That's the thing about a leader, when you know you got people to move it on. Now, next week, uh, it's going to be Ellis and Deus. Yes. And uh, so he's going to go right on just like the program went tonight. He's going to move just like that, <laughs> same way. All right. Uh, let me make this announcement before I pray and make the appeal. Uh, every Thursday, I just got a text from my uh, son, Patrick, that's over the program. Every Thursday from 10 until 2, uh, you don't have to be a member of Great Open Door, but if you know a family or somebody that need food, uh, some help with food, every Thursday from 10 to 2, they can come to the church at 141, not, not, 120, not 135, but 141, the door will be open to get a box. And there are boxes here tonight. If anybody need a box tonight or know somebody that need one that's on the other side, you can gladly get a box for that. All right, so that's what we want to do. Yeah, but every Thursday from uh, 10 o'clock in the morning until 2, uh, Pat and someone else will be here to sh give out the food. All right? Now, let's praise God again. Let's give um, Elie Jones a hand. This was good. This was good. Very good. So now we know that after every service, we ask for offering or doing this service. And it's no different. Many of you... Uh, don't come to the Thursday night service, but I do know that you send, when you send your tithes and your offering in and so forth, uh, you punch them in. So we that are here is going to make ready for that. But Father, we thank you tonight for the word that has gone forth. And thank you, God, for those that are watching us by uh, whatever media they are watching, God. We thank you for them. And we pray, Father, for their families. We pray for their safety. We pray, God, that they would honor you, God, just as though they was here. They've been doing that. And we praise you for great open door. And for all of those, God, that are not even a member that have planted seeds, planted seeds in this ministry. Thank you, God, for them that are blessing their own churches through their tithe and their offering. And every time that we bless, God, the ministry, regardless of who we're blessing, we are giving it to you. We're giving as unto the Lord. And so, God, you bless them. Even though they're, going to, they're saying that the unemployment, the unemployment is going to run out, but you never run out, God. You are present help in times of trouble. And God, whatever the stimulant was, you are a great stimulator. You are for God, our provider. You're Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So provide for those, God, the needs. Meet the needs, God, of those that don't know whether they're going to have their rent, those that don't know whether they're going to make their house payment. Bind the devil, God, and you, God, in the name of Jesus, open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings on your people now. Let them know, God, that you are God, that you can bless in the midst of famine. You can sow. They sow in their seeds, and they did them, God, in the midst of this famine. You bless them, God, and you you keep them healthy. Remember those that are sick, those, God, that are in hospitals, those on ventilators, those that have on cancer, those that have gotten worried about diabetes and they're looking to lose a limb, a leg, God, an eye, but you bless them, God. Strokes, God, we bind them now in the name of Jesus. And we ask your blessing on all of these that are watching by faith. In Jesus' name, thank God. Thank God. Amen. And you that want to share with Great Open Door, the app is on. If you're on Great Open Door app, if not, you can download the app for Great Open Door, and it'll give you all the information on how to share your offer on PushPay. And if you don't have PushPay and don't want to go on there, you can always mail it in to 135 West Victoria Street here in the city of Long Beach, California, and the zip code is 90805. And if you live uh, in the city and uh, you want to bring it by, you have that privilege also to bring it by. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in tonight, and we pray that these services are uh, next week. <coughs> Ellison Day is going to be going through the 22nd chapter and the 23rd. And so 20, these are all praises of David. They're praises of David. So we want to do that and be ready for next Thursday night. God bless you. All of those that are online that's watching us wherever you are, God bless you, and good night or good morning. God bless. And we here is going to bring our offerings. <laughs>